In this video, we are covering AC circuits. We'll start off with resistance in an AC circuit, move on to capacitive reactants, inductive reactants, impedance, which is similar to resistance, and circuit resonance. Now, to save on time, I cut out all that theoretical nonsense and a lot of the proof, which is just kind of filler for the physics books anyway. So starting with resistance in an AC circuit, an AC circuit is defined as a circuit with a AC voltage source. AC voltage varies with time, behaving with the following equation. So you'll see your voltage equals your V naught times your sine of omega t, this should be in parentheses, and that's equivalent to your V time time V naught multiplied by your sine and your omega is called an angular frequency. Your angular frequency is always in radians per second, and your frequency is always in hertz. Sometimes you'll be given those two to solve for one or the other. So omega is your two times pi times f, and your f is your frequency. So your omega is equivalent here, so here it's pretty simple. One is just substituted in for the other. V naught is your peak voltage, which is your maximum voltage. So whenever you hear maximum or peak, you should be thinking not. And not is just a sub zero. So you'll see you'll be seeing V naught and I naught pretty often. Moving along to AC current and power. AC current with time behaves with these two. So when you see current, this is nothing new. Your I is your V over R, and you remember that from your DC circuit stuff. So it's also equivalent to your V naught over R times your sine theta, and your theta is your omega times time. Here you see the same but substituted in and finally, your DC I is V over R. When you're asking for AC current for peaks, you want to think not. And here are your different equations for all those problems. Now, your I naught is your peak or maximum current. So again, when you hear peak or maximum, you want to hear not. Your average current is always going to be zero. You'll get a lot of tricky problems saying what's the average current here and there with all these different formulas, equations, and variables. Average current, zero. Keep that in mind. Your average power, this is also nothing new. P is I squared times R, or one half I naught squared times R. And that's the same as your DC power. Nothing has changed. This is nothing new. Now, RMS is called your effective current. Whenever you see the language effective current, you want to equate that with R M S, and again, nothing, nothing changes with this, with any of your other formulas from your DC chapter. So to get the RMS of anything, you just take the peak and divide it by root two. So whenever you hear effective current, effective voltage, effective anything, you're thinking peak and dividing it by root two, and that will give you whatever variable it is, but the RMS of that. And relating all of those together, your average power would be half of the I naught squared times the resistance, or the squared of the RMS times R. But it's still, it's just I squared R, which is equivalent here. Nothing has changed. This is all the same stuff from your DC currents. AC voltage. Your peak voltage and peak current behave together with these two formulas, V equals IR, well, V naught equals I naught times R, and V RMS equals I RMS times R. What you should come away from that is just keep your naught and your RMSs where they belong when you're getting, when you're solving for those two variables. RMS voltage is your effective voltage, and again, just rearranging this and including some previous equations from other chapters. Your V naught is your R M is your V RMS, your effective voltage, multiplied by root two. And your effective voltage, just rearranging that, is your V naught over your root two. And to get your RMS, we already talked about that. That's your peak over your root two. So that's how those are related. 
Now in an AC current, systems use the same stuff as DC, but use the RMS values, and which is basically dividing everything by root 2. Already went over that. The equivalent expression. So here I wrote them all out as your average power P equals I squared R, which is also your I times your V, or your V squared over R. Again, this is nothing new. That's all you need from that whole section. 21.2 capacitive reactants. RLC circuits have a constant flow of charge and that is limited to your capacitance. Um, so your capacitor is going to limit that, your flow. Um, your current is the max when voltage is zero. And on a graph, current leads your voltage by 90 degrees. This isn't as important unless you're taking calculus-based physics where you use a lot of the trig integrals whoops, B over A. When you use a lot of your trig integrals, but that's sort of beyond the scope of this video. Capacitive reactants. Uh, capacitive reactants, your XC and your inductive reactants, your XL are your bread and butter of AC circuits. This is the stuff that's really important. That's your capacitor's resistance to getting charged. Because in an AC circuit, that flow is always moving and it doesn't stop when your capacitor is charged like in a DC circuit. So when you hear reactants, you want to think the letter X, and when you have capacitive reactants, it's, an, it's a C. So that's all you really need to know. So your capacitive reactants is your omega times your capacitance, and again, you can substitute your 2 pi f in with your omega. So these are equivalent expressions. And your capacitive reactance is always given in farads per second, which is also equivalent to an ohm. And if you don't remember, the ohm symbol looks like that, and farads are just going to be an F, either like that, or a normal F, or sometimes you'll see it cursive, depends on your book. Really doesn't matter. C is your capacitance, and the F is your frequency, and that we already covered when we were looking at the definition of omega. So your capacitive reactants X sub C can be seen as equivalent to a resistance, but it's the resistance across a capacitor. So when you see capacitive reactants, you're thinking com resistance across capacitors only. And when you're asked for the effective voltage across a capacitor, it's nothing's different here. It's V equals I R and your XC is your resistance to charging, so that's just like a resistance. So it just takes your VIR and just takes it to, I guess, a different aspect of that when you're looking at AC circuits. So that's capacitive reactance. Now this page didn't scan very well, so I'll do the best I can with this. Um, inductance is the resistance offered to a circuit by anything on that circuit using Lenz's law. Really not that important. Um, just know that inductance is resistance, and anything that offers resistance is an inductor. That's given by the variable L. When you see L, think inductance. Your inductance is given by omega times inductance, and then you can substitute your 2 pi f for your omega. And again, your x is reactance. When you see C, that's capacitive reactance. When you see L, that's inductive reactants. And again, V equals IR. You have that right here. When you're asked for your voltage through an inductor, it's your V RMS, I RMS times your XL. And for a capacitor, it's your V RMS, I RMS times your XC. That we covered already in the previous section. Moving on. So V an inductor, an alternating current. Okay, impedance. Now an RLC circuit, this is a circuit that has all three components. So in a series of RC circuits, you're gonna start drawing phase diagrams. Now if you remember your vector quantities and vector addition from way, way back in physics one, vectors in circuits are called phasers and they represent your R, which is your resistance, and your reactants, which are your X's, your XC and your XL. R is always on your positive X-axis, and your capacitive reactance is always on the negative Y-axis. So from here, you're going to get R, which is your impedance. So your positive X-axis 
is your resistance, then your negative y axis is your capacitive reactance. So your z is what's going to connect those. And as you see, it's essentially the Pythagorean theorem. So a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So that's what your phase diagram for that would look like. So your impedance, when you draw that out, is just your a squared, b squared, c squared. So your impedance is actually r squared plus your capacitive reactance squared. As you saw from your r and capacitive reactance. Real simple trig stuff. If you're taking the calculus-based physics, this might be more intuitive to you. For the rest of us, this is all you really need to know. So, and again, if you're asking for the VRMS, since your Z is equivalent to R, they're basically both resistances, VIR, you would just stick a Z in there. So VIR is the same as VIZ. And again, remember that with AC circuits, it's IRMS and VRMS. Moving right along, if a circuit has RLC components, RLC, resistor, L is inductor, C is capacitor, and here is another way to get it using a more complex phase diagram. So Z is R squared plus the quantity XL minus XZ squared. When you write that out a few times and study the phase diagram, when you remember your trig and how this all fits together, it makes sense. It's really not overly important. You might want to just memorize the phase diagram I drew earlier and this one, though I'm sure your book already has it. Your phase angle is given by tangent phi XL minus XC over R and that's for an, only for an RLC circuit. Sometimes you'll see RL circuits, RC circuits, or any combination of the three using only two but for RLC circuits, your phase angle, you want to use this equation here. Where'd my pen go? Bong. <coughs> your power factor, again, this is nothing new. P equals I times R, only in AC circuits, you're using your RMS values. And now your power factor is your cosine phi, and your cosine, your power factor is, design, is defined as your resistance over your impedance, which is basically R over R, um, but you want to use your Z value. And you'll be given both. I know it sounds a little counterintuitive, but in your problems you'll be given R's and Z's, and this is how you get your power factor. So when you think of power factor, you should be thinking cosine, and when you think of phase angle, you should be thinking tangent. So your VR is equal to your RMS voltage, your effective voltage time cosine theta, and your cosine theta can be replaced by R over Z. And here I have several of these previous equations all written out together with how they relate to each other. If you want to impress your physics teacher, solve some of these for the others. And I mean, it's really nothing different. Your average power is your IV times cosine or your I squared times impedance times cosine theta. And again, you can always replace your cosine theta with your R over Z. And the last section, wow, well, that was quick. Your last section is your circuit resonance. Your resonance frequency F naught. When you think of F of naught, you were thinking peak, but when you doing frequency, don't think of this as peak, think of that as resonance. So your resonance frequency F naught. And you get your F naught with this. So it's 1 over 2 times pi times the root of your L times your capacitance. And your XL, your impedance, your Z, is at its minimum when your capacitive reactants and your inductive reactants are equal to each other. And these are only equal to each other at the resonance frequency. So at this frequency, whatever that is, your XC equals your XL. So if your XC is equal to your XL, and you look at your impedance formula, that's how these two are related. So if these two are equivalent, this is going to be, you know, like 1 minus 1, if they, if they are 1, just for argument's sake. This would be 0. So then you would have your Z is the root of R squared 0, so your Z is equal to your R, but only at 
f naught, which is your resonance frequency. Now that was quick and dirty without any of the theory to save on time. Check out the video on the mastering physics for this chapter where we will do all the problems and I'll also have another video doing problems out of the book. Uh, thanks for watching.